and I am willing to take uh, interventions, obviously, because we have a bit more, a bit more time. So, this year in Allen and Deeside, we are delighted to be celebrating the 125th anniversary of, of Shot and Steelworks. Yeah. Now, under the ownership of Tata Steel Group. The plant employs around 800 people and is an integral part of the local community. For generations, Shot and Steel has provided secure jobs, supported the local economy, and has made the, the Shot and Site synonymous with quality, productivity, and innovation. Celebrating this significant landmark is an opportunity not only to reflect on the past, but to also prepare for the future challenges in order to ensure that Shot and Steel plant continues to flourish and that it, rem that it remains a stable employer for a hun another 125 years. I should say at this point that I would probably have retired by then, but uh, you never know. You never know. You never know. I will give one. Jessica Morden, <laughs> <laughs> On that point, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and may I congratulate my honourable friend for having this debate tonight, and, mm. and on behalf of Llanwyrn Steelworks, um, send greetings to Shotton on its 125th birthday. Llanwyrn is considerably younger, I know, but would my honourable friend agree? Um, it's important to emphasise just how interconnected operations are in Wales between South Wales and North, all parts of Wales in the steel industry, and how important shopping is for steel producers in South Wales. Uh, yes, I would totally ag agree with my honourable friend, and, it, and that is a very important point because although Shotton is doing Touchwood very well at the moment, we are reliant on Port Talbot for the steel that we then. Finish. So without that, then the, the actual business model doesn't, doesn't work. Now, for decades, Shot and Steel has produced some of the finest steel products in the world. Today, as part of the Tata Steel Group, it takes its place in a network of steel makers stretching across five continents with around 81,000 employees. Shotton is well known across the world for its extraordinary quality, efficiency and profitability and is the company's base for a unique range of metallic and paint coated products used widely in the uh, uh, domestic appliance sector, construction and other sectors. And even in this digital age, steel is essential for our public services, for manufacturing and for our military and for everyday essentials. Shotton has a long history providing a solid foundation on which its current success is built. Now, John Summers was born in the 1820s and ran a small business using one of the country's first handheld rolling mills to roll puddles of iron into crude steel sheets for clog nails. I must say, I wasn't around then. Uh, no, really, really, really. But, and after his death in 1876, the business began to expand under the leadership of his son, Harry, who, joining forces with three of his brothers, grew the business and opened the Harden Iron Works on the banks of the River Dee in 1896. Now, with a 250-strong workforce, and the installation of eight steam-driven rolling mills, galvanising pots, annealing furnaces and corrugating equipment, this was the beginning of the shot and steel plant that we know today. Workers travelled from all over the country, such was the production demand, and by 1902, Harry Summers had turned the plant's attention to steel production with the site and shop and being recognised as a leading steel manufacturer by 1909. John Summers and Sons were now the largest manufacturer of galvanised steel in the country, with a site covering 60 acres and employing 3,000 workers. Now, one of only two strikes in the work's history caused major disruption to production between 1909 and 1910. The dispute concerned the contract system, whereby each mill, one person, the contractor, employed ten others on, piece work, on a piecework system. It was common for workers to be paid according to favouritism <laughs> rather than the hours they actually worked, 
or productivity. Sounds like the Tories, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can only agree with my honourable friend. And there was even, uh, believe it or not, the idea that some received payment in the local pub by way of a pint or two of beer. Now, as a result, many joined the Steel Smelters Union in protest, and to avoid industrial action, the Summers family drew up a deal with the disgruntled workers. However, the deal failed to avoid industrial action as the contractors protested against it with daily picketing at the factory gates. The dispute came to an end in December 2010 following a mass address to the workforce by Harry, who agreed to replace the ad hoc contract system with a direct payment of wages. Progress indeed. Following this period of uncertainty, Shotton focused its efforts on the First World War, producing thousands of steel sheets for the trenches, Nissen huts and shell making. Despite jobs in production remaining strictly for men, many women entered the site for the first time to carry out clerical work. In the immediate post-war years, Shotton Steel maintained its success with the workforce rising to some uh, 5,800. The period between the two world wars saw considerable change in both production techniques and global demand, with a general decline in demand for black and galvanised sheets, which at one time accounted for 98% of Shotton's production. Disruption continued during the Great uh, Depression following the Wall Street crash and Black Friday, when two-thirds of Shotton's work workers lost their jobs and the plant closed its doors not to open again until 1933. During the Second World War, Shotton Works operated at full capacity, producing 2.2 million tonnes of black and galvanised sheets for various uses. Most notably, I'm sure people will remember, I don't know, first hand will remember, but the Anderson Air Raid uh, shelters, which saved many lives during the Blitz. Unlike the First World War, women were now employed in the labs, packing departments and on cranes, making up around a thousand of the workforce. Now, Harry Summers died shortly before the end of the war, but has always been uh, remembered fondly. A more fearless, a more honest, a more straightforward man, it would be hard to name Richard Summers in his uh, obituary to Harry. His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, officially opened the first phase of the plant's post-war development scheme in 1953, giving the plant additional uh, space. At this time, steel consumption by the UK car industry had increased by 88%, creating a dramatic rise in demand. Under Harold Wilson's Labour government, shot and moved to public ownership under the British Steel Corporation, employing 12,000 people of the 270,000 uh, British Steel Corporation employees nationwide, a figure that, if we think of the workforce today, is a dramatic, dramatic change. Mm. While this marked the end of the summer's ownership, for generations after, the family name remained synonymous with Shotton. The summer's family had guided the company to become world leaders in steelmaking, putting Deeside on the global stage. And I know even now people still refer to it, many people still refer to it as Summers's. The name has lived on. The 1970s were dominated by disputes over plans to phase out iron and steel making at Shotton as part of the government's deep seated review of the British Steel Corporation. Following several protests and back room uh, negotiations led by the Workers' Action Committee, in May 1977, the British Steel Corporation removed proposals for the termination of iron and steel making at Shotton. And with trading prospects looking brighter, the, re the review was put on hold in until 1982. It, it's, it was sad and sadly rising oil prices and declining demand for strip mill products brought the review forward to 1979, resulting in a plan to end iron and steel making at the plant in 1981. 
Around 6,400 jobs were to be phased out following an agreement between the British Steel Corporation and trade unions. No community in living memory had faced the prospects of such a substantial uh, job loss and such a rapid loss of jobs. I think it was the case that it was the place where the largest number of jobs were lost on a single day in a single plant anywhere in Western Europe. However, as a result of the, the only second period of industrial action in its history, some 7,000 workers clocked off in December 1979 anyway, never to return other than for counselling. The heavy end closure was eventually complete in 1981. The Workers' Action Committee, which had fought hard for the retention of our iron and steel making at the works since 1972, formally disbanded their campaign, probably the longest in British industrial history. And it had been successful to the extent that the government decision was reversed on two occasions, with the British Steel Corporation withdrawing its uh, closure proposals to totally on one at one time. Despite the eventual loss of jobs, the Shotton campaign is regarded by many in this place, trade unions and others, as a model for collective resistance. By peaceful demonstration, reasoned argument and persuasion, the men and women of Shotton won support and sympathy at the highest level of government. And at this point, I should put on record my thanks and I'm sure everyone at Shotton's thanks to Lord Jones, now in the other place, who led uh, delegations, campaigns, and spoke many times in this place and in the other place, and continues to do so in support of Shotton and how vital it is to the area. Towards the close of the century, Shotton's productivity saw strong growth with modern equipment and processes, an increasing product range and high quality performance. Shotton was the centre of Britain's coated steel production once again. By the time the Chorus Group formed to run the Shotton plant in 1999, productivity had tripled compared to 1986 levels. Chorus was acquired by Tata, the Tata Steel Group in 2007, and despite financial, uh, global financial challenges, the work remains, uh, remained profitable uh, and forward-thinking. With a focus on high-value products, the works achieved a record level of pro uh, pro profitability within 10 years. Today, Shotton's primary markets are consumer products, uh, construction and supplying global brands such as Airbus, Jaguar Land Rover, IKEA and Wix, employing, as I said, around 800 people. In its 125-year history, Shotton has remained resolute and is still one of the largest employers in Allen and Deeside, fostering hundreds of livelihoods. Now, we can reflect on the history, but we shouldn't dwell on it. The next 125 years are just, if not more important than the first. This government must step up its support for the UK steel industry as it continues to face critical challenges. A decade of government indifference and failure to take action has caused the UK steel industry to nosedive by a fifth. That's a £1 billion hit to our economy. And since 2010, the UK steel, UK steel production has plummeted by 21.5%, 20 times that of the average among European countries. And we are all experiencing today the dramatic rise in gas prices, which hits shot them very hard because it relies on gas mainly for its energy. But when we look at gas and electricity prices and we look at the comparison with Germany, 60% I think cheaper, France 51%, it's probably a miracle we have a steel industry at all. Well, my honourable friend, I, will, give way. I will give way. I, I thank my honourable yeah. friend for giving way and uh, as my honourable friend uh, from Newport uh, God, West, East, 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 East. I always get this to me. <laughs> Newport East has just absolutely rightly pointed out there is a family of steel making plants in, uh, in Wales, and um, Port Albert obviously being the hub, and we send birthday greetings to Shotton. 
Um, the integrated nature of the steelmaking process means that energy costs for Port Talbot, which have the highest energy costs in Wales, is absolutely crucial for the entire steelmaking uh, process in Wales. And the fact is, as my honourable friend has rightly pointed out, we are trying to compete with one hand tied behind our backs because the government's inaction is leaving us with massively higher energy costs uh, compared to our European partners and neighbours. And I, I hope the Minister isn't going to say, well, we pay the Energy Intensive Industry Compensation Fund because these uh, energy price disparities are after that uh, fund yeah. has been... Yeah. Uh, been provided, so let's please not hear that line again from the government. So, will will my um, does my honourable friend agree with me that this is the number one top priority? We're just asking for a level playing field. We've talked about the past, but the present and the future are so much more important. Unless we get this sorted, we're going to be uncompetitive for another year, two years, or even 125 years. I think um, I think my honourable friend makes. Uh, I, I, Vitally uh, important point, and I would totally agree with him. And would it, my honourable it, friend give way? I will. I will give way. <laughs> would my honourable friend first and foremost uh, congratulate Shot and Steel uh, Plant on its 125th anniversary? I bring greetings from Trostro, which this year celebrated merely 70 years of existence, oh. but which, like Shotton, uh, uses the steel produced in Port Talbot. And would my honourable friend agree with me that not only must the government now pull out all the stops to actually ensure the very existence of our steel industry facing these astronomical and totally uncompetitive prices, but that the government must now also invest in a massive renewable programme in order to, to secure energy for the future and to help the decarbonisation of steel production in this country and ensure the future of Shotton, Trostra, uh, Planwer and uh, Port Albert. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once again, I, I agree with my uh, honourable friend. And I would also say that I am very concerned that the government only ever seems interested in the steel industry when we are in crisis. When, yeah. crisis. Yeah. Yeah. when there is a crisis, suddenly the government is all over the steel industry, and the moment it drops out of the headlines in the newspapers, so does the government's interest yeah. in the steel industry. And that is just not acceptable, because as my honourable friends have said, the danger is, at one point, the industry will fall over, or, or significant parts of it, which will lead, as my honourable friend has made the point, that without Port Talbot, the danger is there wouldn't be a shot in either. Yeah. Uh, and that's a point the government really needs to grasp. And there is no mention of steel in their latest budget. No mention of steel in their so-called plan for growth, and their industrial strategy is effectively being scrapped. And there is a total failure to support environmental targets with investment that could boost decarbonisation in the industry. Funding uh, for the Clean Steel Fund has been delayed until 2023. And, as I've said, the issue of high energy prices has been completely ignored. All we ever get is, oh, it's, it's nothing to do with us. Have a look at Ofgem. Maybe they can do, maybe they can do so. And, and that is not acceptable. And Labour's analysis shows that 24p from every pound spent on steel for government infrastructure uh, projects was spent outside the UK in 2017-18, meaning plants like Shotton and, all the, and other plants throughout the UK have been left behind. And really the government is making an utter mos a mockery of their pledge to level up with actions like this, which leave behind uh, steel areas completely. Stronger by, by British steel targets could create and safeguard around 50,000 jobs and boost the economy by an estimated £4.4 billion and also vitally uh, lower the environmental damage of steel imports. True levelling up would consist of more than just rhetoric. It is clear that we need decisive action and decisive planning. And we only heard a couple of days ago in the other place that steel for our warships, steel yeah. for our submarines, yeah. is being imported. The argument being, we don't have it in this country. We don't have it in this country because we were not told soon enough that the plant could actually start producing what was actually needed. And the end result is that we are importing steel to build warships, 
and submarines. That is how stark the position is, and this is how stark the failure of this government is. As well as taking action to secure the next 125 years of production at Shotton, we must also reflect that Shotton is, making, is taking in the fight against climate and ecological crisis that we, that we face, a point my uh, honourable friend has, has raised. So we, we need a green plan for steel, and we need it supported by the government. Now, I want to see Shotton Steel become the first carbon neutral plant in the UK. Shotton has been central to much progress in steelmaking for more than a century, and it would be fitting for the plant to lead the country's decarbonisation efforts. Unfortunately for, us, unfortunately for us in Wales, the government, the Welsh Labour government, is already taking these vital first steps to support Shotton's path to becoming carbon neutral. The Manufacturing Action Plan for Wales, a collaborative effort made between Industry Wales, Trade Unionists and representative from man the Manufacturing Centre uh, sector is central to this pro progress. First Minister Mark Drakeford is stepping in to take action in pursuit of a prosperous, green and equal economy. Now, the Tata Steel Group has been clear that decarbonisation and securing a green approach to steelmaking are top priorities. Shotton is already playing a key role in the fight against climate climate change uh, through the application of products used in the uh, construction of active buildings which produce more energy through renewables than they actually consume. And there is scope for more progress and we must support and encourage Tata with that. Now many critics argue that decarbonisation and economic growth in the steel industry are somehow mutually exclusive. But with, a fight, with the right financial backing and strategic approach, Shot and Steel can lead the UK steel industry to being carbon neutral and continue to support uh, jobs uh, in North Wales. Now, we hear a lot from this government, we hear a lot around that hydrogen is the future. It may well be the future, but it isn't currently the present, and it won't be the future unless we invest in it because it is not just going to happen by accident that one day we wake up and the steel industry and other industries are suddenly have plentiful supplies of hydrogen and it works and everything's fine. We need to be um, research, ploughing um, uh, investment into research now, otherwise we will fall further behind and we are already falling behind our European neighbours. So the steel industry in Allen and Deeside is the very fabric of our area. It provides highly skilled jobs. Yes, just sorry. On that, on that yeah. point on, on hydrogen, it relates back to this discussion we were having about uh, energy costs. Now, an electric arc furnace approach or a hydrogen-based approach take even more energy and power and electricity than the current gas-fired uh, approach. So uh, if we don't get the energy costs issue sorted, it's also going to completely hamstring our efforts towards decarbonisation. I would absolutely agree with my uh, honourable friend. And we have to look at the whole picture and not just, not just part of it. So... Wait, on that point. Yeah, I'll uh, just in term, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for giving way on that. Uh, just on the point about uh, the, the whole picture of costs and so on, and I was listening very closely to what he was saying about energy, and, but, but this is where the, the Labour Party's proposals uh, that we should be introducing a total review of business rates uh, is critical also to this industry, because as we know, the, the comparison to, say, a uh, business rate equivalent in this country to Europe is something like a 70% disadvantage to the UK. My mm -hmm. friend makes a very good point, and it, it, it is like everywhere or which way the industry turns, it seems to be at a disadvantage than uh, its, its neighbours. So I implore the government, instead of just turning their backs, turn towards the people they serve. Mm. We say provide a proper industrial strategy for the industry and for the workers, support the industry to decarbonise and place stronger targets to buy British. It is our duty, our place to stand up to represent the industries and businesses providing 
uh, uh, livelihood for the people we represent and the lifeblood to our areas, and while at the same time taking steps to secure a green and sustainable environmental future for us all. Shotton has provided communities in Allen and Deeside with secure employment since its inception, supported the local and global economy and provided vital quality products for infrastructure developments. The Government must recognise and support the Tata Steel Group in their effort to transform into a green steel producer. And I will, and I'm sure my honourable friends, will continue to demand that funding is properly directed to that area. Above all, I will continue to stand with the workers of Shot and Steel, the trade unions and the management, for it is their skill and dedication that maintains production and innovation. It is they that keep Shotton at the heart of the um, community, and it, it is they who will be central to the next 125 years of steel making in Allen and Deeside. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. 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 Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak this evening. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member, and I congratulate him for securing this debate, a very important debate for him and his constituents. And it's very important that we celebrate this extremely important milestone for his constituency and for North Wales in general. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be able to contribute and to respond on behalf of the government today. Um, I will confess, I don't know a huge amount about Shot and Steelworks. I come from a very different part of the, of the country, but it was very helpful to hear all of the history which the Honourable Member outlined so clearly and cogently over the last 20 or so minutes. But from the little I do know, I know there are many reasons to celebrate the 125th anniversary of Shot and Works. One is some of the history that he himself, had, the Honourable Gentleman himself, has gone through. And it's been fascinating to hear of the contribution that Sean has made over so long, the deep embedded history within the community, and the opportunities that it's had over a century and a quarter. And that contribution has occurred over so long, including producing millions of tonnes of steel sheet to build shelters for the population in the Second World War, as an example. Um, shortly after being appointed the Minister for Industry and the Honourable lady from Newport East highlighted the interaction of the steelworks across Wales and more broadly. I had the privilege to be able to visit Tartar's plant in Port Talbot, which was an extremely interesting and useful uh, visit for myself. And I was impressed by the scale of the plant and the level of the integration of the systems. I haven't yet had the opportunity to come to Shotton. I am looking forward to doing so in the future, but I am aware that Shot and Steel can be seen in a huge number of places, from IKEA stores to Jaguar Land Rover showrooms and even at the Old Trafford Stadium. And the sculpture commissioned to mark the anniversary also showcased the best of the plant's products and will be a proud reminder of this milestone. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to highlight the constant evolution and innovation of the Shot and Plant. But to do that, I just wanted to pay tribute and to highlight the very regular discussion that has been had on Shotton over so many decades in this place, not least because of the Honourable Gentleman's contributions as the constituency member of parliament since 2001. He also referenced his predecessor, Barry Jones, who uh, was just an assiduous uh, 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 contributor on this particular issue. And then his predecessor, Irene White, who uh, was back in 1954 talking about shot and steelworks and how they had secured record steel production. And it was a pleasure to work through Hansard for a little while uh, this afternoon to understand all of the history and its relation to this place. And I think it's been talked about as far back as November 1948 when there was a big discussion about whether iron ore should have been brought over from Birkenhead or not or should have been uh, sourced from elsewhere. And I know how important this is for his constituency on a personal level, because I come not from a particularly steel-based constituency, although I have lots of steel very nearby, 
but from a constituency which has a very proud industrial heritage and a very proud industrial past and is making its way in terms of the new industry, which I know he is so keen on in the coming decades as well. And so from my perspective as the Member of Parliament North East Derbyshire, as well as being the Minister for Industry, um, the, uh, the knowledge that I have in terms of Sheffield Steel, I recognise, mate, Sheffield Steel is so important to local communities, which had such an integration into the histories of those communities, and I've no doubt that that's the same in Wales as it is in Sheffield. And my own constituency had some of similar challenges. We did have a steelworks back in the 1870s, just a little before his steelworks, the Honourable Gentleman's Steelworks uh, began, and our steelworks closed overnight in 1883, and all of, the, all of the activity was moved up to Cumbria, and so on a very uh, small scale, and long before my time, um, I'm completely aware of the huge interaction and the huge importance of steelworks and industry in general to local communities. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to applaud Shotton's commitment to becoming carbon neutral by 2040 and for their efforts that they've made so far. It is great to see that the site is running the scheme and has been doing so for the last 15 years, offering to offset customers' carbon emissions, which has seen over 130,000 tonnes offset via investment in clean energy projects in the developing world. And also I pay tribute to its local work with Natural Resource Wales, to create bird habitats, and I understand that 20,000 turn chicks have flown from the breeding grounds created in the lagoons, which is a hugely brilliant example of how nature and industry can coexist together. And I just wanted to turn for a moment, if the Honourable Gentleman wouldn't mind, uh, to some of the points that he made about going forward. We know how important Shotton is and the history of Shotton is to his constituents, the Honourable Gentleman's constituents. But we also know that we have a shared collective aim to try and ensure that we can secure the future of steelmaking in this country and in the important areas where it has uh, thrived for and has such a history for so long. And although we may not agree on every single element of the Honourable Gentleman's speech tonight, I know he is assiduous in his concern and his interest in this area and he is keen to see the greater progress and improvement of it. But I would just like to touch on a few of the points that he made in a, in a spirit of constructiveness, given the, the debate tonight. I mean, I, I would just urge slight caution, although understanding the, the challenges that he sets out around the concern that the government isn't taking steel seriously. I do think it is important, whilst we do have challenges, whilst we do have issues, whilst there is no doubt there are, there are challenges which are coming our way in the coming decades. I think that the government has demonstrated over a number of years its willingness to support the steel industry where that is necessary to ensure that the UK has that resilience in steel production. We've talked about some of all the references already been made around subsidies that were provided to support electricity for steel and other energy intensive industries over the past decade, nearly decade or so. We have the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund, which is helping to change and transform steel makers in Wales right now. There is a project going on elsewhere in Wales right now. We have the Net Zero Hydrogen Fund, which is coming. We have funding currently in place for the Materials Processing Institute to increase efficiency, reduce emissions and improve competitiveness. Um, I do, of course, and accept that gas prices are high at the moment. There is no argument about that. Gas prices are volatile and they have been volatile for a number of months. At some points in 2020, the gas prices were relatively low to where they have been historically. They are now relatively high. The support that we've put in place for energy in intensive industries since 2013, I hope, has mitigated that to some extent and we have confirmed that that will continue. I would be happy to give that. Thank you for uh, giving, giving way. But even before this recent spike in energy prices, the comparison with Germany and France yeah. was actually even more stark. Yeah. And that, you know, that is yeah. because this government has consistently failed to really address this fundamental imbalance in the system. I'm grateful for his intervention. I know that he will... Uh, he will not expect me to accept that point. I, I, I will t if, I, if I take it in part, we, we accept that there is a challenge with energy prices 
at the moment. And we understand that that is concerning and causes concern for a number of energy intensive industries, whether it be steel or like in the debate that I had with a number of colleagues who were in this chamber and beyond last week in another place or with ceramics and with glass and with paper and with others. And we are keen to understand the detail. It's important that we recognise that there is nuance under this debate. There are different strategies which are being employed by different companies here. There are different contexts within which those energy prices are applied. This is a diverse group of industries which are impacted by the high gas prices. There are efficiencies elsewhere which I know are being pursued. There's hedging strategies which are in different places. So I hope, whilst I accept the Honourable Gentleman's challenge that the energy prices are high, albeit volatile and variable. I also hope he would acknowledge that uh, we, are, we are really trying to look to work with the industry and to work with the sectors to understand the very different challenges that are in place at this current time of high gas prices, and we will continue to do so over the coming weeks and months ahead. And I, I just wanted to touch... Uh, I would be happy to give way to the I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way and, and I applaud him for, for the ambition in terms of looking to address uh, energy costs in these energy intensive industries uh, that he's just identified. Would he welcome and support a move to a greater number of onshore wind turbines, which would be one of the, the best providers of low cost energy to this country? Grateful to the Honourable Gentleman from Reading's uh, uh, in, uh, contribution. Uh, if he will forgive me, I will perhaps not set energy strategy in terms of wind turbines today. That would be a matter for another one of my colleagues in the department. But what we, his, the, the broader point that he has made is that over the coming decades, just like over the previous decades that we've had some success on, we do need to decarbonise our electricity supply. And by doing that, through whatever process by which we can achieve it, it will ensure that we have clean and green energy to be able to support the kind of industries that we are talking about today. I just want to touch on a couple of points finally before I close. Um, uh, the Honourable Gentleman for uh, Alan Deeside has highlighted the government, uh, his concern that the government doesn't focus on steel. I, I wouldn't accept that point and I would just say in the 10 or so weeks that I have been uh, the industry minister. I have visited two steel mills already. I have had very regular conversations with the companies involved. I have met them on a number of round tables and I will continue to do that. And I hope on a broader level, things like uh, the announcement at COP26 of the Glasgow Breakthroughs, working with a number of countries around the world to try and make sure that we can decarbonise these industries which are more challenging to decarbonise, it indicates a desire to find ways through difficult challenges where there are no easy answers, where the government and communities are trying to work through how to do that. And one of the ways to do that is through hydrogen. And the Honourable Gentleman from Allen and Deeside highlighted that extensively in his previous speech. And he was somewhat sceptical about the, about the UK government's activities in this place. And I would just remind or place on record for completeness that there has been a significant movement on hydrogen in recent months, the publication of a hydrogen strategy in August, the hydrogen business model, which is being consulted on, the net zero hydrogen fund, which is nearly a quarter of a billion pounds, and the UK low carbon hydrogen standard. Of course, there is much more to do on that. That is why we're putting in place the frameworks in order for that to happen. But I hope it demonstrates an intent from the government to explore the possibilities around hydrogen in the future. And then finally, I just want to touch on procurement, if I may, because I know it was an important part of the Honourable Gentleman's speech. I will be happy to give away. Um, just before he moves on to procurement, um, it is disappointing that he really does not seem to have taken on board the seriousness of the energy costs, 61 per cent above major competitors, and that's before any of the crisis, it's before any of the conditions that we currently face now. And I would ask that he does now really take that seriously. And can he go back and have another look and have a real think about what we're going to do? Because we are genuinely facing potential extinction of our steel industry if we cannot be properly competitive. I'm grateful for the Honourable Lady's uh, intervention and I'm grateful for her highlighting this. I know it is of vital importance for companies up and down Wales as it is across the country. I would just 
um, reiterate that we do take this issue seriously. I have much of my time as Minister for Industry in, in recent months has been in terms of meeting and speaking with those who are impacted, and getting to, into the detail of what the concerns are that they have, how it is impacting individual companies, how it is it impacting individual sectors. We know there is a diverse range of sectors, as I've outlined, and we will continue to work with industry to see whether what is possible and to, and to work within the wider context of volatile and variable gas prices over the coming months ahead. Just turning to procurement briefly before I close, um, the honourable gentleman made a number of uh, highlighted his concern around procurement. I would again just highlight gently the procurement task force, which is underway at the moment. And it, it is the case that a substantial amount of UK-based procurement in the public sector is supported by UK Steel at the moment. But last year, over £100 million worth of steel was UK Steel was procured by. Uh, major public projects in the UK. Um, Network Rail, eight, they're reporting 85% of the steel that they took in 2019-2020 in were from UK producers. High Speed 2 reported that all of its structural steel did the same. We want UK steel to... Uh, we know that it's a brilliant product. We know it's a brilliant set of opportunities. And we want them to, to be able to take the opportunities both within the domestic UK, uh, UK market and globally over the course of the coming years ahead. Just... In conclusion, um, I hope um, from the conversation and discussion and debate that we've had today, it is recognised that on all parts of the House we take the importance of the UK steel industry for resilience and for ensuring that we have a clear pathway forward is taken as read. Steel is important to the UK, it's important to the UK Government. We have given a substantial amount of support in recent years and we will continue to look at what is possible in the coming years as well. We recognise there are challenges here and the work continues but I want to thank the Honourable Gentleman for Allen and Deeside for allowing me to respond to these points again. I congratulate him on the debate he has, made, he has provided today and I wish Shotton all the best in the next century and a half. From this uh, proud Welshman can you take very warm wishes <clears throat> and congratulations to everybody at the House of Commons to Shot and Steelworks to the current workforce and the former employees and their families and congratulate them all on this incredible milestone. The question is that this House do now adjourn. As many of them say aye. Aye. As you know, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order.